everyone. Uh, this is John Cogley, owner of Daniel Smith, and welcome to In the Artist Studio. Today we're with Jane Blondell. Jane is an artist, a um, uh, huge um, understander of pigment, and she's also a Daniel Smith brand ambassador. Um, she's speaking to us today from Sydney, Australia, so she's down under. Jane, it's fantastic to have you here. Welcome to In the Artist Studio. Thank you, John. Nice to be with you. Today, if you would be so kind as to um, show us your studio, we would love to see your studio. Um, All any, right. any paintings or um, information you're working on? I know you're, you're working on your website, so you can tell us about that as well. Uh, we okay. really would love to learn about you. All right. Well, I have a, a small, a compact studio, but it works very nicely. So I'll reverse the camera and uh, show you around. There we go. So there's my desk. <laughs> this is where I do filming all the videos that I'm making for my online course and the computer and uh, looking out the window. Oh my God, that is beautiful. I've done a number of studies looking out my window. And then I have, have like many artists, collections of many, many sketchbooks and art books and all sorts of things and the compulsory little companion for the art studio. <laughs> and collections of brushes. I love Chinese brushes and more sketchbooks, my own books and fun things to paint and draw like these things. I love collecting dried up things and drawing them. Oh yeah, seed pods, beautiful. So is there any, uh, any artwork that you're currently working on? Well, I'm working on the um, information for my online course called Mastering Watercolours. But what I have been doing is doing Zoom classes with my students. So with those, I've been doing some sort of demonstration work. So I can show you that. Um, come back. Strange working with video backwards and forwards. I'm working mostly in sketchbooks. So this was a study that my students were doing from a photo. It's a photo I took when I was in the Greek islands last year and we were looking at working with just zooming in on a small section of something, working with pen and watercolour. You can see this one's all full of those lovely earthy colours. This one we were looking at how to do fabric. So this was a, um, a demonstration I was working on um, to show them how to render fabric in watercolour. And this one they wanted to know how to do reflections. So we're looking at reflections in water um, of a photo I took in Amsterdam last year. This one we're looking at shadows and rocks um, and I did two variations, one of them in pen with watercolour, really coming into the detail, and the other one in water-soluble pencil and watercolour. Once again, going into the details but then adding the colours and shadows. Very nice. And then that little seed pod that I showed is uh, right here. Oh yeah, beautiful. So I do a lot of work in sketchbooks at the moment. Um, they're, they're so portable for travel. So that's what I tend to work on most of the time at the moment. When I do big paintings, um, they tend to be fairly detailed. I'll see if this one will work. Oh yeah, we see it. It's a doorway in Venice. And then sometimes I do paintings that are completely abstract or um, more realistic, but I tend to work mostly from, from life and mostly fairly realistic colours and as accurate as possible, which is where I really enjoy the Daniel Smith colours because you can really create accurate colour and uh, and then also play around with the, the wonderful pigments that you have in your range. 
So Jane, do you, when you're ready to um, paint a subject, um, I know just from what you showed me right now, some of it is from things that you have, for example, the seed pod. Do you also paint from photos and do you also paint from just ideas that you have in your head? Yes, I do all of those. Um, my preference is to work from life, but it isn't always practical. So I have this, there's, there's more collections of things all over the place that I'll pick up and, and, and paint and draw. Uh, I've always liked to work from life. Um, when I was a teenager, I'd, I'd pick flowers and draw those, or I'd uh, collect dried up flowers and those sorts of things. So going right back as, as long as I've been uh, working from anything, I think I was 11 the first time I started sketching and drawing from life. So no. it's just always been my preference because then it's the natural light. As soon as you work from a photo, you've got then the, the change of colour and the change of, you know, if you then print the photo, there's another change again through the printing process. So I think if you work from life, you're seeing it in its most, the most realistic that we can do. Um, but sometimes it's just not practical. I mean, that, that door, I, I couldn't really sit out in the middle of winter in Venice for the hours it took. So that one's from a photo. But if I work from a photo, I really, really, really want it to be my own photo. I don't, I don't want to work from someone else's. So it's, um, I think it's important because then if you've, if you've created your own photo, you've already done some of the editing that, that gives it your own view. Whereas if it's someone else's photo, there's obviously the problem of copyright, but also it's someone else's view. So it, it always, it just isn't something I've wanted to do. Oh, very nice. Um, I saw that you have a, a, some really beautiful brushes. Can you tell us a little bit about your brushes and, and kind of what brushes you use? Well, I tend to work with Raphael, Da Vinci or rosemary brushes. So I'll show you some of those. So on my, on my table, I have a bunch here. Um, I love round brushes. So pointed rounds, this is a, um, a Da Vinci, so I'm not sure how, no, I'll bring it over here. A Da Vinci pointed round, and this is a mop style. Um, the mop or the quill, and it's called that, as will be known, because the quill was originally made out of feather, so it was originally a bird quill. These days it tends to be plastic, but it's held in with all these very fine wires. So it's a traditional French style of brush. Whereas this style, which is also um, a pointed round, is the, the feral version. So the two different styles just feel different. So those are both sables, but one's a feral and one's a, um, a quill. Oh. Um, one's Vinci, this one is, is the, the rattle. I've those for a long time. And uh, if you look after your brushes, they, they last for a, a very long time. I also have a number of rosemary brushes. Um, there's a Da Vinci that I tend to use for doing large areas and so on. It's a, a one inch mop. Um, I do have a rather large collection of brushes, but <laughs> I lived in Singapore for uh, a, a number of years. But when I was a teenager, there was a wonderful art shop near where I lived called Will's Quills. Great name run by a, a lovely man called William. And I bought some of the brushes way back then, and that's a long time ago. Um, and these are a really high quality um, equivalent of a sable uh, hair. And at the time they were what I could afford, but they're really lovely brushes. So I worked with Chinese brushes for a long time. And Chinese ink, this is a traditional ink, um, ink stone. And, um, and, I would, and I'd actually grind the ink into it and draw and paint with Chinese ink. So I've done a lot of work with Chinese pigments, but they, there are some issues with light fast with some of the pigments. So I tend to use traditional watercolor now. Excellent. So if you had to pick a color, a color, and, and it's a very unfair question, if you had to pick a color, what color would you pick as being your favorite and why? It is a hard question. Yeah. Um, it depends a little bit on the mood. Um, I mean, if you had to only paint with one colour for the rest of your life, well, I think you'd go nuts. But um, um, you'd have to be one that has a, uh, an ultimate tonal range, all those sorts of things. You know, I'd probably do James Gray. <laughs> uh, there you go. It's a beautiful colour. <laughs> um, but if I, I think you have to think about what, if we go to the, the, the top three or the ones that you work with most or the ones that do the most, um, I would pick a, a really lovely primary triad. Um, Hansa Yellow Medium, a nice primary yellow, um, Quinacridone Rose and Ultramarine. 
Those three do a huge amount, and I'll I'll show you just a sec um, because it's a. I just think of that as a great basic triad that does such a lot. You can see there that all of those swatches are done only with those three. Oh, that is great. so you can make you can make beautiful burnt sienna, uh, sorry burnt sienna or quinacridone burnt orange colours. You can make Indian red colours. You can make lovely greenish yellows, you can make all sorts of blues, all sorts of purples, lovely greys, lovely browns. There's just not really anything you can't make. Perhaps the only problem, you, the only colour you really would struggle with is a really, really rich crimson. But that's about it. So with those three colours, you can paint most everything. But it takes a while. You know, you've got to then mix and mix and mix. You need to have a lot of mixing space, a lot of colour understanding to be able to work with it. Which is why I would then add burnt sienna and um, maybe a, a, a yellow earth colour and others as well to speed up the process. And remember particularly, as I mentioned, that I like to work from life. So if I'm sitting outside um, for a couple of hours, you can't always be sure that a truck won't stop right in front of where you're painting or that it won't rain or you need to work quite quickly. So while I know that there's a huge amount I can do with those three, I tend to have a few others for convenience just to speed it all up but making sure that you've got harmony. Those three give you a great start. So if I had to just choose three, those are the three I'd probably work with, but uh, I'd still want more. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, so you're working right now with, uh, on, the, on the internet with your students. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any other tip or technique you can share with the people watching or is there something more that you would like to talk to them about? Um, well, there are, there are so many tips and techniques with watercolour. It's, it's deceptively simple and yet it's also one of the most complicated. Mm -hmm. So I think that you can, you can play with watercolour and work with watercolour on so many levels. Um, I think that a lot of the people who end up working with me have started, they've done a bit of playing around and then they want to find out not just how it works, but why it works. Um, and so understanding more of those characteristics and how to utilize those characteristics. I think one of the biggest things people struggle with is controlling the amount of water and paint ratio. Um, they paint too wet or they paint too dry and they can't get it to flow. Um, so understanding that I think is really important. And that's an area that, um, I, I try and build up a language where I can say, okay, we're going to mix it to be like, like black coffee, for example, where you have a, an idea of what that looks like and feels like. So if we picture black coffee, it's, it's a totally liquid, but, but you couldn't see through it. Um, so that gives us our kind of a mid-tone. And uh, if we were to make it thicker, it might be more like a, a full cream milk. So if you actually look at it on the paper or look at it on the palette, it's going to move more slowly if you can picture a wash of, of milky um, consistency. If we were going to add more pigment again, we might make it like a cream. And that's about as thick as you ever want to work with watercolour, a kind of creamy consistency. It would move very slowly on the palette. And then if we go back the other way, if we go from our coffee and we add more water, so it becomes a bit more of a transparent, that's going to give you our, our fourth tone. And then water that down again to a sort of a, a weak tea, the sort of thing that if you dunk a tea bag in, into water that's not quite hot enough, it'll just tint the water, but it won't really um, add that much colour. And so I work with that idea of those five, five tones, so the weak tea, the tea, the coffee, the milk and the cream. Mm. And then I, I get people to actually try that and make a chart of that. Um, I'll show you an example, because it's a very helpful way to, to build a language and to see it on a palette, and I'll show you how it looks. Oh yes. So you can see the, the dark, I would have it here is the cream, the milk, the coffee, the tea, and the wheat tea. And this is actually done with a mixed black, but it could be done with anything. But, but understanding that really does help to be able to control the watercolor. And uh, another area that a lot of people struggle with is, is actually the amount of water that they add into a wash. And so the general principle there that I think is very helpful is to remember that if you put drier into wetter, so less water on the brush compared to what's on the page, 
then the colour will be able to, to stay there and strengthen. But if you put wetter into drier, it's going to push and cause blooms or cauliflowers. And so that principle as well, if you kind of have that in mind so that you know how wet your paint is on your brush and wh what's happening when you're painting onto the page, it can really help to control and make sure that you don't end up with you know, strange things happening on the page. So those sorts of things, I think, are two really important ideas to keep in mind to help to control this wonderful medium. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. So today Great. we're in the artist studio with Jane Blondell from Sydney, Australia. And Jane, I want to thank you very much for taking time with us today and uh, to show us your art, uh, to share your ideas. Um, it's appreciated. I wish you and your thank family you. health and wellness. Thanks, John. Nice speaking with you. Bye. Bye. -bye.